Welcome to UO Today. I'm Paul Peppas, director of the Oregon Humanities Center. My guest today is poet Mary Jo Salter, author of eight collections of poetry. She has also written a children's book, The Moon Comes Home, and a play, Falling Bodies. Salter has been honored with fellowships from the Bol why don't you tell me how to say that? Bulyasco. Bul Bulyasco Foundation, the Guggenheim Foundation, the National Endowment for the Arts, and the Rockefeller Foundation. Salter is a co-editor of the Norton Anthology of Poetry. She is the Krieger Eisenhower Professor in the Writing Seminars at Johns Hopkins University. On April 19th, 2018, Salter gave a reading from her latest collection of poetry, The Surveyors, as a guest of UO's Creative Writing Program. Thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you for having me. First, tell us a little bit about your background and especially how you found your way to a career as a poet. Well, I suppose part of my freedom was that I was allowed not to think of it as a career. I, I grew up in a household where I was really never asked, how are you going to make a living? And I suppose that may have had to do with se the sexism of the time, but I'm, it, for, for once, grateful for that. Um, my, my father was a, an advertising man, my mother was a painter, and both of them loved literature, music, art and so that was the environment and I, I don't know why poetry uh, grabbed me but it did early. I was about seven when I wrote my first poem and by the time I got to college I knew that that was the most important of the arts for me. Um, you are sometimes associated with the so-called new formalist movement or the neo-formalists. Um, tell us first of all what is that and do you think of yourself as one of them? Yeah, I, I, I think I, it's a fair category to put me in if one needs categories, but I'm not very interested in them. Mm -hmm. And um, I am proud to be listed in the same sentence as many other formalists, but I guess the distinction I would make is between being a formalist where you have a, some kind of agenda and that poems must rhyme and poems must be in meter, and being someone who just likes form, likes to work in it, finds it congenial for developing ideas. Um, I think music um, is so much a part of what I love about poetry that rhyme very often comes into it. In a strange way, it's useful to have these categories just because one does want uh, to be read later, and the way one is read later is generally speaking through universities and colleges. Mm -hmm. One is, if you're, you're lucky enough as I am this week to be sharing my poems with students, um, it, it, categories can sometimes seem uf useful. On the other hand, no, I'm, I'm not interested in any ism particularly. Okay, well on, on that, um, would you, instead of talking about that, why don't you, would you be willing to read us a poem? Of course. Um, why don't I read from the title poem? It is a Crown of Sonnets, which uh, means uh, that, as, as I know you know, um, a sonnet, a, a group of sonnets in which the first poem, uh, the first line of the first poem is the last line of the poem, and the, and the last line of each sonnet is the first one of the next. Um, I'll read just the first, uh, the first sonnet, and I'll read also the uh, epigraph, which is from a, a friend of mine who wrote me a letter. Uh, he asked me in this letter, also, I had a dream about a year and a half ago that I read a poem called The Surveyors, and it was by you. Does this poem exist? I cannot remember any of the words, only that there were all four seasons in it, and that there were nice descriptions of a chain being made taut, the running out of the chain over and over. So this is Matthew Yeager, young poet, who dreamed that I'd written a poem. Dear Matt, I'm sorry to say the surveyors does not exist. Despite my being haunted by your question for a long while now, imagining time and again that the past can change, that the poem is on the list of things I did once because you dreamed it of me. It's true, I regret, I've never put all four seasons into one poem, though the Shakespeare sonnet I love most keenly, 73, that time of year thou mayest in me behold, implies them, and I wish I'd made a gesture at least of homage. 
But when I read your letter in the autumn of my life, I felt no cold. I heard Vivaldi's spring scrape violins over and over like the running out of chains. I'll just start the next one. Over and over, like the running out of chains, I've already quoted wrong the thing you said, not being you, I can't be in your head. You can't follow me back there, hearing strains of Vivaldi in cafes, etc. So the running out of chains um, is a place where I can start again. And of course, a crown of sonnet is a kind of chain. And so it took me quite a long time to realize when my friend wrote me this about this dream, what form should this poem take? Mm -hmm. It, I really had the idea for about two years before I thought chain of sonnets. That's what I have to do. Mm -hmm. well, that's a great story. Um, the the poem that you just read uh, mentions reading in the autumn of your life. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there are a number of poems in the volume that are engaged with memory of the past from the perspective of someone in the autumn of their life and with aging. Yes. Um, and I, you know, I uh, I think. Students of poetry are aware that there is this category of, of poems that tend to be written by um, older poets about aging. Yeah. And I'm interested in how you understand your own sense of that as a topic for our poetry. That, that is to say, thinking about uh, being an older poet. Mm -hmm. How do you understand that as a theme in this volume? Can you say something about that? Yeah, that's a great question. And um, I. I never set out to make that the theme, but it became sort of the inescapable theme. And uh, I assumed that the poems that were most explicitly about that um, w would be uh, the ones that other readers might also enjoy. But of course, you are writing for younger authors, <laughs> uh, readers. And I was uh, at the pleasure of being interviewed by a very young woman who said to me that the poem she liked best was one about my being young and pregnant. <laughs> and I thought, well, good, I'm glad, because I, I don't want, I don't actually want to be the old poet all of the time. Uh -huh. um, on the other hand, I mean, all poems are about time. Mm -hmm. And um, the perspective of the young poet, although very often the young poet is writing about childhood memory, um, the perspective of the young poet is also one of imagining the future. And for me, that has been less about imagining the future of my own life, but imagining the future of this world around us, mm -hmm. whether and specifically about technology, which does come into the surveyors and some of the other books. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's a complicated answer, but that, that's uh, sort of how I, uh, how I feel about it, is that I must write about time because that's who I am, but I hope that it has some larger significance within our time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, one of the things that obviously comes with having a long career as a poet is that you get to a point where you can look back on your career from your vantage now, and you've mm -hmm. begun to speak about this. Do you think that your, that you, your style, uh, your approach has changed at all over the course of your career now that you think back on you know, yourself as a young poet versus mm -hmm. yourself now? Yes, I think probably is, is the the biggest change has not been thematic so much as technical. I do continue to love form, but I have a more liquid sense of what that is. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm, I, for example, in that Crown of Sonnets, you would probably call that formalist, but there is no sonnet that follows the traditional Shakespearean rhyme scheme or the Italian rhyme scheme. I make it up as I go, mm -hmm. and I also enjoy writing in off rhyme a lot, and that may not seem like much of a departure, but uh, the influence of Emily Dickinson in particular, and I was talking to some students at uh, the university about that yesterday. Um, the, the the influence of Dickinson has been profound for me. I mm -hmm. think she has has located um, ideas through off rhymes that are 
more expansive exactly because she has not restricted herself to the to the exact ones. So that's one thing that's changed over my career. Mm -hmm. Tell the truth, but tell it slant. Exactly, right. yes. exactly. I note also that one of the Crown of Sonnets poems is 16 lines and not 14. Right. Which you discuss in the poem. <laughs> right. I, I didn't want anybody to think that I didn't notice that. Um, I wrote it as 16. And I went, oh, that's 16 lines. I think I'd better acknowledge that in the next sonnet. But it's it's also about being wrong. I think a lot of what my writing throughout my career has been has been about being wrong, mm. misremembering, misseeing, mishearing, not perceiving another person in the way they wish to be perceived turning into a different person and wondering who was that. So it seemed okay to have a 16 line sonnet. <laughs> Would you read us another poem? Sure. Um, well, let's, uh, let's talk, uh, let's, since we be, seem to be talking about aging, this one is about people even older than I am. Um, and uh, it's, it's about the very old and it's called old saw. The cat is out of the bag. The horse has left the barn. The train pulled out of the station. No bridge is left to burn. The genie can't be put back in the bottle, and in short, it's long been time to take our medicine. They threw us under the bus. It feels as if we're to blame. Maybe we are. We wonder, when did we turn obtuse? How did we lose our charm? Why do our old saws, our hats, our radio shows, so harmless, make them squirm? And do they think we love their swear words and tattoos? If we could, we'd take a walk. It's years since we could drive. They roll their eyes when we talk. They're glad when we go to bed. Why did we wake today on the wrong side of the dead? Such an amazing poem. Um, you want to say a little bit about the um, the voice of that poem or the the point of view of that poem? Uh, it's kind of wickedly satirical. Mm -hmm. um, I love wickedly satirical writers, such as Evelyn Waugh, who I was just rereading yesterday on the plane. I thought, I don't like flying. I know what I'll do. I'll read <laughs> Evelyn Waugh. And um, they threw us under the bus. Uh, all of these cliches that the poem begins with, I, I have a theory about things you shouldn't do, like writing cliches. Mm -hmm. You shouldn't do them only once. Do it a lot so that your reader knows that you meant to do that. <laughs> um, and sort of like if you, if you have a 16 line sonnet, alert your reader that you meant to do that. And so um, I do have a 92 year old father and um, I think a lot, I see him a lot, I think about him a lot. And I think about that period bef before he actually developed uh, dementia when we were talking, but uh, there was a feeling that we couldn't communicate at the level we used to. Mm -hmm. And I suppose my own guilt, uh, they're glad when we go to bed. It's an effort. It's an effort to cross generations. Mm -hmm. And I wanted it. I wanted to write something pr from the perspective of an older person who knew how he or she was being dealt with. Mm -hmm. I think that's one of the things that's most powerful about the poem is to make those of us who are rolling our eyes or f being glad that they're gone to bed, that they're, they're not oblivious to those yeah. attitudes that we have. Yeah. Um, you just mentioned sort of the, the challenge or the importance of speaking across generations. Mm -hmm. so, and you've already spoken a little bit about younger poets, you are, in addition to being a distinguished poet, you are a distinguished teacher of poetry. Say a little bit about how you approach the challenge of teaching poetry to younger poets, up and coming poets. Well, I think it's different for undergraduate and graduate students. Uh, uh, for, the, for the majority of my career, I taught at Mount Holyoke, and that is undergraduate. And uh, the goal was to encourage those who might have the talent and the drive to be poets for their for their whole lifetime, um, but it was also just to introduce through the writing of poetry how to read poetry, how to appreciate poetry. Mm -hmm. That's that's I think a, the fair um, balance in an undergraduate uh, 
class in poetry, but for my graduate students, and we only accept at Hopkins, we only accept four p poets a year. These are people who've really made a commitment to try to have this very difficult career, which will not pay you enough to do, not to do something else, mm -hmm. which will not be understood by most people. Um, so I feel that this, because the stakes are higher, uh, the criticism has to be tougher. Uh, the demands for reading have to be greater. Uh, and also, at the same time, because they are adults who are finding their way and finding their own voices, I have to be very careful not to try to rewrite their poem for them the way I would write it. And so it's, it, it's a seeking on their part to gain more knowledge, but it's also on my part um, to, to let them find out who they are. Mm -hmm. So you spent a good part of your career at Mount Holyoke, you said teaching undergrads, and now mm -hmm. you're at, at Hopkins teaching graduate students. Um, has that shift changed your poetry, do you think? That is to say that now you're working more closely with mm. graduate student poets? A little bit. Uh, I have certain graduate students who know much more than I do about particular um, uh, sectors of literature. For example, I have a graduate student who is a very impressive classicist who's mm. translating from both Greek and Latin. He's definitely teaching me, and he's making me think differently. The most common way, the most typical way in which they influence me is that they are much more aware of the latest new online magazine, the latest 24-year-old who's getting a lot of attention in their world who I probably would not be reading if they didn't tell me. Mm -hmm. So I can bring the Milton and they can bring me somebody new, and that's all good. Uh -huh. um, let me ask you a couple more questions about the volume. So tell us about the structure of the volume. So you have in the center of the volume the mm -hmm. surveyor's uh, sequence. Mm -hmm. so what about the, how, how you put the rest of the volume together? Again, really good question. I tend, in fact, every single book I've written, uh, I have taken the poems and put them on the floor mm -hmm. and rearranged them and seen how they speak to each other. And that can be, uh, a pleasant revelation, and it can also be, oh, I've really done kind of the same thing twice here. Mm -hmm. And I take the, literally take the poem out, mm -hmm. and I either think I'll, I'll save it for another volume, or maybe I won't publish it. But um, I thought for a long time that the poem called Bratislava was going to be the first poem, and that poem is about uh, being a traveler with a new partner after a divorce and seeing a new world. And then I thought, well, that's, that is important to me and I hope to the volume. But what the book is really about is looking carefully. And, um, and so I started with a, a poem called Yield, which is about a yield sign at the corner of my street that I used to be able to see um, from my window as a child. And so it introduced the notion of a deep past followed by, much later, a recent past. And then uh, with the end of the book, um, I, I end with my marriage to the person who had been my companion in the, be in the beginning of the volume and the kinds of, uh, it, but no, not only that, um, it's an opening out into the world because um, he was drafted during the Vietnam era, and here we are in Iraq and Afghanistan, and it's called an Afghan carpet, and too long to read here, but it's, a, it's about coming to terms not just with each other, but with history during our lifetimes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You mentioned that the, um, the, the poems, a lot of the poems are about looking, and there's a number of ekphrastic poems yes. where you're you're speaking about a painting, mm -hmm. and then there's a number of poems that are literally about photographs. There's yes. a couple where you're going through your photographs. Mm -hmm. Say a little bit about why that mm -hmm. is uh, one of the sort of subcategories of, of poems in this volume. Yeah, poems about painting, um, that I, I've enjoyed writing them for uh, throughout my career, and, I, and it probably all begins with being a painter's daughter, and she used to take me to the museum, but I do think think that art about art 
and sometimes art about art about art, mm -hmm. um, it, it can allow us to see more clearly. And so uh, photography uh, is, is a sort of different category because it involves not only art photography but our snapshots. Mm -hmm. And my friend Fred Hirsch, a uh, jazz pianist and composer, and the two of us wanted to work on a project, and we decided we would do a song cycle. We ended up calling it Rooms of Light, the, the Life of Photographs. And so we pitched ideas to each other about all sorts of um, photographs. Uh, and so I put those poems, so The Surveyors is a middle section of this book, and another is a selection, not the entirety, of the, the song lyrics that I wrote for Fred about um, photography. One of them is um, about about going to Europe and uh, for the grand tour after one after uh, after college and looking back over snapshots and sort of seeing in this fast shuffling through snapshots. Oh, that was your life. <laughs> what what happened? You know. So, um, would you like to read us? Uh, sure. Um, the poem is called "Here I Am," and it's in the voice of a woman. We had different characters singing these songs. Uh, the voice of a woman who is looking through these photographs. Here I am making my grand tour the summer after graduation. What is this? Must be the Rome train station. We never noticed we were poor. Backpacks and low-rise jeans. We never lived beyond our means. Back then, there were no ATMs. Here we are, my friends and me. We're napping on the bank of the Thames when love was free. Here I am with that girl I met on the trip to Brussels or Bruges. My God, her duffel bag is huge. What was her name? Yvonne? Yvette, she ditched me. I'm forgetting why. Oh yeah, when I slept with that Swedish guy, his sleeping bag was full of fleas. Here we are with our bread and cheese on a park bench in the Tuileries when love was free. Here I am, a woman in the middle of her life, and her life is an endless riddle. In all of Europe, I couldn't stir up a memory more unlikely and foreign than me at 22. I can't help gazing at her bright young eyes, at her nice firm thighs. Was I ever 22? Look at her skin, it's amazing. Can you be me? Am I you? Here I am at the Berlin Wall. They tore it down, but it's still there in this picture, like my long dark hair. But there's a wall between her and me that, like me, won't be getting thinner. Here we are, myself and me, thinking, ich bin ein Berliner, but who is free? Here I am, looking at this kernel of myself, and I feel so strangely maternal. Do I have a choice? I can't believe I'm hearing my own mother's voice giving me advice. Did you pack your passport? Sign your traveler's checks. Don't talk to men, they only want sex. Keep a ladylike appearance. And when was the last time you sent a postcard to your parents? Here it is. Here's my postcard to me. I've become my own mother. Never thought I'd be. But here I am. Here I am. Another wonderful poem. That one, um, one of the things that's so striking about that poem, and it happens at a number of poems in the volume is, the conjunction or the combination of a kind of rigorous formal fixed form and a kind of colloquial, almost comic mm. voice. Mm -hmm. Say a little bit about your understanding of that dynamic, because it, it, it marks a number of poems in the volume, yeah. Uh, yes, I think, you know, I, I never met Philip Larkin, I never heard <laughs> him read, but I think he has been a big influence on me. I love the way mm -hmm. he combines uh, the formality of, uh, of technique with, and to some degree, a formality of, of phrasing with suddenly um, 
just uh, <laughs> phrases that cannot be repeated on the radio, <laughs> you know? And yeah. so uh, that, that, I think, has been a guide for me. Um, I just tend to just love uh, comic, uh, writers with a sense of humor. Mm -hmm. I, I, and I mentioned Milton earlier. I'm always saying to my students, <laughs> Milton ha is the one exception. He's the only great writer I've ever met who doesn't have That's any so sense of humor. <laughs> but I do think it's a, it's a lot of how we get through the pain of life yes. is satire. <laughs> yeah. Um, can you say something about what you're working on now? This volume's been out for a few months. Say something about what you're working on now. I, I've been writing poems as they strike me, but increasingly I'm feeling I would like to either have a section or make it most of a book that would be ekphrastic, would be um, poems about paintings that are particularly important to me and have been through my through my life. Uh, and I have always said with students, you know, I don't want to see the, a, a reproduction of the painting that you're writing the poem about, but there can be an interesting uh, there, a tri triangulation or new information that that is conveyed if you can see the photograph or the painting. I'm thinking of uh, a, a new discovery for me. Other people have been reading him for a while, but Teju Cole, mm -hmm. who is both a great photographer and a very fine writer, and his uh, new book, Blind, a new-ish, new for me, uh, book, Blind Spot, includes photographs he has taken, paragraphs that are almost prose poems, and he is a great lover of poetry himself. And then some of them are explicitly about those photographs, and some of them are not about them, and you have to do the triangulation. Mm -hmm. And in that way, it sort of makes, uh, makes a poem. So I'm not going to copy him. I, no one could, but I'm inspired by him. I, I'm thinking, why pretend that I don't want to write about art all the time? Because I do. <laughs> well, we, we're, we're basically out of time. Let me just say, I've really enjoyed our conversation. Thank you so much for taking the time. Thank you for this wonderful book, and good luck on the new project, and have fun here on campus. With Thank you students. so much. I really enjoyed it. I've been speaking with a poet Mary Jo Salter. She is the Krieger Eisenhower Professor in the Writing Seminars at Johns Hopkins University. On April 19th, 2018, Salter gave a reading from her latest collection of poetry, The Surveyors, as a guest of the U of O's Creative Writing Program. Thanks so much for watching. <laughs>